Hello and welcome to the Comics Pals. I I got to tell you guys, it is 1 p.m. right now, and I don't know what to do with myself. I have literally never podcasted for this show at 1 p.m. It feels like a different world right now. Well, Sean, live at least. I'm pretty live, sure you live, guys live. used to. Oh, please, yeah, we used to. <laughs> you do guys used to podcast things. from like 10 to yeah. 5. Yeah. yeah, it was yeah. it was dumb and horrible. <laughs> um, but no one cares about us today because well, today. We are joined by a very special guest, so special that we changed the start time of the show. That has never happened in the history of the Comics Pals. We didn't even do that for Jeff Johns. We didn't no. even do it for Jeff Johns. The we made time. Jeff Johns get up and be yeah, here at sure 7 a.m. Not, not only okay? that, he, he got up at 7 a.m., but he was in the WB Studios office at 7 a.m. Uh -huh. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> he didn't sleep there, okay? This this is making me less cool the longer you guys do it. <laughs> <laughs> but but we do have, of course, as you guys know, because we promoted it to death, uh, we have the writer of the newest, to me, hottest book, uh, Black Cloak. We've got the writer behind Black Widow, Captain Marvel, Mr. and Mrs. X, Rogan Gambit, Name the book. It's Jeff. Okay. Not the writer. Um, that's the book. We have Kelly Thompson with us. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, guys. And um, I'm glad some of you are living your best life at this new time. I I want to assure everyone out there that while I'm very grateful that special treatment was made, all I did was say that was a little early for me. I swear I didn't pull any crazy diva things. I'm not in a green room somewhere with a list that includes weird things like sushi at 10 a.m. Uh, you know, I uh, they were very accommodating, and I'm glad Ooh. to be here. What am I doing with all these green M&Ms then? <laughs> well, you're in England, so... Eat them. That's all I have. I, over I don't have them. <laughs> Kale, I was about to say the exact same thing, Kale, and that's scary that we thought of the same stupid joke. So. <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like a mind meld with us too. That's dangerous. No, yeah, that could end the world. Um, so we have a laundry list of things to talk about with Kelly. Um, from again, Black Cloak to Substack to working for Marvel, you know, all all the fun things. Before we get into that, I do want to really quickly let you guys know, especially if it's your first time here, uh, we're the Comics Pals. Hello, at the Comics Pals all over social media. If you want to support the show, uh, the best way to do that is patreon.com slash the Comics Pals, where for as little as $3 a month, you can support your boys, and you get access to some pretty cool stuff, including our newsletters. Uh, you get access to our exclusive show over there, Palling Around, and you can get a, uh, well, you can vote in the book clubs, and you get a, uh, a shout out on the show a superhero or supervillain nickname and a shout out. So thank you to these lovely people. Thunderstruck, Rebecca Alejandro, the Night Stalker, Harris Najinsky, Brian Demolisher Del Pozo, Random Rocio, Kefis the Incorruptible, the Great Destroyer, Hyper Viper 89, Momentum, Mike Elliott, Starcross, Catherine Stars, Diamond, Dustin Whitley, and Hound of Justice, Atomic Hound. Thank you all so much. We appreciate it. If you want to watch this show live, that's Twitch and YouTube on Saturdays at 10, 15 a.m. Eastern. Thursdays for Pals Polls, that's our comics review show where we did indeed review Black Cloak. For everything else, at the Comics Pals, done with that. Okay, Kelly, Black Cloak. Now, I have to admit something to you right away, and I am ashamed, but I have to admit it. <laughs> okay. I had not read one of your books before Black Cloak. None of my books? None. And it's not, wow. I don't even know how. Wow. Hey, listen, I appreciate you taking the chance. And that sort of means a lot like that. You I mean, I know I sort of forced you guys into it with the <laughs> with the voting. But, hey, I'll take it any way I can. Well, um, I, I, I appreciate I was, you yeah. giving it a chance. Of course. I, I was telling the guys before. I don't even know how that's possible because <laughs> yeah. in preparation for this, you know, looking at what is what has become a, a, a prolific backlog of books. I'm like, how the hell did I avoid this? This doesn't make any sense. But. <laughs> When I read Black Cloak, I was like, oh, shit, I've been missing out. I'm the idiot. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Sean, say that again. No. <laughs> Don't clip that we'll, either. We'll clip yeah, it. Um, yeah, yeah. No, let's people, not, let's clip not clip it. Yeah. <laughs> let's not clip it. Oh, that's um, on my soundboard. <laughs> no, Black Cloak is phenomenal. 
Um, it, it really is. And it's, it's of course, Kelly Thompson. It's Meredith McLaren. It's Becca Carey. Uh, a, a, a tremendous creative team. And I felt, I felt that from literally the first page. Because I, I opened the book and I read that first, that first, um, like inner monologue, I guess. And it's brilliant. It, it established exactly the vibe of the book. Like it starts so typical of a fantasy noir sort of detectiveish book. Um, it's got those trappings. And then as it, as it like, goes down the page and each narration box it gets less and less like typical and it devolves to the point where the word fuck is there and i was like oh this is the book for me yeah well honestly i'm glad because i weighed that fuck a lot because you know you can't do that in big two comics and you are saying something when you put that on the first page and you're turning some people really dramatically off. You're also changing your rating instantly. Mm. Um, and so I thought about it a lot. But at the end of the day, I was like, I don't know. That's who we are. Like, I can't. I'm not going to hide it. Like, people should know on the first page, like, that that's what we're doing. So we went with it. And um, I, 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 it makes me feel good to hear you, like, literally respond to it. Because I think that that... You know, you don't get it when you make a choice like that, you know, other than success or failure, you don't right. get a lot of feedback on, hey, this choice really made a difference for me or like helped solidify something for me. And um, it also means a lot because that's a really big deal for me is vision from go. Mm. I I think a, a problem with a lot of books I see and create all, all books, creator owned and big two corporate books, is that it takes a minute for them to find their footing and to be consistent. And listen, that's fair. I mean, remember when we used to watch, we're all old enough, I think, that we've watched pilots back before it became what it is, where it's like you watch a show and you were like, oh, there's some really interesting stuff here, but they don't really, it doesn't seem super confident yet. Like they don't really right. know the style or the tone or like what they're going for. And like, we used to be a lot more forgiving of that. I don't know what caused that change where now if an episode one isn't a perfect summary of where we're taking you and what it's going to be. I mean, we just clock out. I, it might just be because there are so many options compared to what it used to be. Like it used to be, maybe you'd find something and you're like, Oh, I'm, this is worth it to invest in this. And maybe it's going to become this really incredible thing. But like now it's like, you have so many options to choose from. If it doesn't get you in one, you're done. You're not coming back. You have a thousand things you could do instead. So for me, I feel really it's really important that you've got your very clear telling your reader from the jump what this is going to be from page one and from a issue one. And it's one of the reasons I'm really glad we had this really oversized issue too, because yeah. I didn't want to, you know, that page that you call out is the only page that's got like a voiceover, any kind of narration or caption boxes for other than like locator caption boxes. And um, so sometimes the book is a little underwritten in the sense that it just lets that art do the heavy lifting. And, especially because of that. I mean, you've got whole sections that are silent or that just have a couple sound effects or one little bit of dialogue. And, you know, so you really need that extra big page count when you're building a new world and doing all of that stuff and asking so much of the reader, you know, because there are pages that have a lot of text on it, but you want them to be able to rest between, like, it should feel like that journey, you know? So I feel like we got a really good alchemy in the end on on where we landed. And I'm, I'm glad it's working for people. It, it means a lot, you know? One of the it's things... sort of crazy. I've talked so much about it. I can't believe the second issue isn't out yet. It feels like, <laughs> it feels like I've been talking about it for a hundred years. <laughs> I'm sorry I cut you off, Tyler. No, no, you're good. One of the things that I, that, that we do here a lot and, and something that I've really appreciated is like learning what uh, an issue one looks like for people. Yeah. Um, mm. And specifically with Black Cloak, the, there's a lot of heavy lifting that issue one has to do. Um, yeah. especially when you're, you're in this whole new world, you have all this world building you need to do. Um, and the fact that like by the end of issue one, I understood to an extent, the world that I'm in, the characters, mm -hmm. um, and the actual hook of, of the series. I'm like, Oh, that's a good ass issue one. <laughs> Sometimes like one of those three pieces is missing. And I'm like, ah, where's, 
do I go? Yeah. Do I give it an issue too? Like so, seeing all those pieces there for that that black cloak issue one, especially since it was like oversized, I think that was great for it. Um, mm. Was really refreshing to see. Thank you. I do think um, the way we're doing the world building, um, I'm really proud of it, but I, I can confess it's not for everyone. You know, like some people really like either like the really more detailed, they want to know all the information and that's just not what we're doing. And then other people don't want to work for it quite so much, but I, I like people to work for it. Like, honestly, I need you to work for it because my book won't be as good if you're, if you're just watching TV or doing something else while you're sort of flipping through it and you're not engaging with it, you're not going to get what we're putting. I mean, you might enjoy it. You might be like, okay, cool. That was cool. But like, I'm asking you to do some work. I'm asking you to remember some things and to pick up clues and to understand that, um, you know, gutters and panel breaks, things happen between those that you as the reader are supposed to insert. And like, that's why, I mean, comics is so beautiful in that way. It's such a dance between creators and readers. And I don't, I'm not like, I'm not like trying to put on a hat and like bang a drum, like, Oh, people need to pay more attention to what they're reading. But a little bit I am because I love that part of it. And I think my work can either, it can look very surfacey, like, oh, because I know how to write from doing Marvel comics. I think I've learned very well how to write for, hey, here's, we need our big set piece action beats. And here's our little character moments. And here's our little funny bits and our characters like gelling with each other and stuff like those are all these things you need to make like a fun superhero comic. And I think if you just take, not that everything I do is deep, but there's a there's two levels to any of this stuff I think that's being done well that people are really caring about there's just like a surface story you can read that's just fun and then there's well wait let me really look at this what is this really talking about what what's really happening to this character like and I'm always going for that stuff I I a guy that I was talking to a little bit was writing a thing about my Deadpool run and I've started writing the email to him a couple times because I was reading his analysis and it was really deep analysis. Like it was like, like professorial, Hey, here's our, here, here's our exam tech stuff. Like it was that mm. kind of book. <laughs> and his breakdown of what I was doing on Deadpool made me cry because I was like, Holy shit. This person like really, like really understood what I was trying to do on a level that very few people got. And I don't, I don't mean like, Oh, my devil run is so brilliant. No one understood it. No, no, no. I just mean we had a good time with it. I was having really fun time writing Deadpool, but you know, when you're first talking about how to write Deadpool, it's like very hard because that character's been everywhere and it's done everything. And so we were like, well, what do we want to talk about? What do we want to say? And it was like all this stuff with monsters and what does be, being a monster mean and who gets to define that and like so that's like the underpinning under all the jokes and like reading this guy's academic text of it I mean I just I was like holy crap I was like I did actually do it because sometimes you don't know it unless you have someone like that looking at it from the outside who's never heard you talk about it on a podcast or whatever you know and so it, you know it's really gratifying when people when when readers want to do the work it, it really truly excites me because I feel like we both get something extra out of it you know yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, I think, you know, you talked about how writing at Marvel kind of got you in a certain rhythm of, of, of comics. Um, There's a formula. I mean, right. Yeah. And this feels not, not formulaic, but it feels, it feels like a Marvel comic in the sense that it's breathing, but it's not bogged down by all the stuff that you yeah. typically have to do. Yeah. Um, and so that makes it really fun. And that's unique. I, like no denigration to anyone else, but a lot of the time, especially in comics, uh, the first of something is heavy on exposition yeah. and heavy on like, it just feels bogged down. And this, this book to me, as big as it is, as, as oversized as it is, feels weightless. It feels like it's floating because everything is so breezy, you know, like, thank you. 
Thank you. Because I have a real problem with that. And I think a lot of writers do. We all tend to overwrite. We all at some time in the middle of the night think we're some fucking genius and we start writing too much stuff. And nine times out of 10, when I go back and look at my work and, you know, for whatever reason, uh, what was this thing I said? Am I copying that thing I did three years ago, you know, whatever. I'm always like, man, I should have trimmed this down a little bit. Every time I never go, oh, I wish I had added that last little joke. You're like, it does this, do I really need this? That's covering up her hand. Could we have not lost the line here? Like, <laughs> like that's always the sort of stuff I'm thinking. And so, you know, you try to carry that forward with you and like become a finer, sharper tool for what you're trying to do. And just personally, additionally, I have a real aversion to like I, I see the words, I want this art to do a lot more work and I want the writers to let it do that work. And honestly, when I, when I read those huge exposition dumps or like just a page just layered with text and I, I'm not really talking about old comics. So it was a very different style that we yeah. all grew up with. It's very different, but for modern comics, if I see a page just layered with text, I'm like, why couldn't you get the artists to do some of this? Like, do I need mm -hmm. all of this information? Right. So, you know, but I do think, but again, I don't want to be like when I used to, when I used to review comics and, and do comics criticism and op-ed stuff, um, I was much harder on comics than I am now because I think once you, once you see really how the sausage is made in the machine, it just changes a lot of things. And so I try to give creators the benefit of the doubt because, you know, doing what I'm talking about, you can't just do it from like honing your craft for years. Like for starters, you have to have the right partner that you trust and that's capable of doing the things you're asking of them. So like, there are a lot of steps along the way. It's not just about your strength as a writer. There are a lot of strength steps along the way to whether that's going to work or not to do the story you want. And I think in the case of Meredith and I, I think she's incredible. I've worked with her before. I know what she's capable of. I know what she brings to the table. I trust her and she's not afraid. Um, she never says no, um, which is maybe a bad thing. I mean, she does it her own way. She doesn't ever do just what I want, but she's mm -hmm. always up for it. She's always interested in pushing it. She's always open to new ideas. And like, she also really brings, she's what I hope in a collaborator because, you know, sometimes you look at your own influences and everything and you're like, wow, that's a really, it feels small, that pool. And so when you add another person who has their whole own other pool and now they're bringing all of that to it too, like, truly you want that collaboration it just makes everything better and stronger and more interesting you know uh, you mentioned that that dance between uh creator and reader you know like mm -hmm. you know adding their own stuff in between the gutters there yeah. what is that like um compared from doing you know your creator own stuff with black cloak as opposed to like a marvel comic where like the stuff the reader will bring into it could be based on you know all the continuity, all of their, uh, I guess, uh, baggage they bring to characters. Yeah, it's a little more yeah. freeing. 30, than 30 years of continuity yeah, and experiences. Yeah. yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. And I, I think it's part of what makes it, you know, there are a lot of things that make doing a book like Black Cloak harder than doing an issue of Captain Marvel. A lot of things. And then there are a lot of things that make it easier mm -hmm. and not dealing with, 30 plus years of continuity and all of people's personal like very strong attachments to and feelings about and feelings of the direction in which such and such should go like all of that stuff um yeah it's hard it's hard it's it's hard to wrestle with that stuff and and i think in you know i feel like in creator own comics the fans it's a much it's a much more pure experience because mm. I think I think when the fans and readers come at you on a corporate thing, they're aware you they want you to do what they want you to do. And if you don't do that, then they want you to be replaced because they know you're temporary. And they want to put a lot of problems that are happening on these individual writers who don't really have control, like you know, why aren't, why isn't this character gay? You, you know, you're fucking up or you hate gay people or whatever. And you're like, I mean, I'm just a freelance writer who gets paid not even a living wage. I don't have health insurance. Nobody's going to let me change um, a billion dollar property 
that then there's going to be ramifications throughout. So it's like, I, you know, I understand the complaint. I don't even disagree. I think everyone's in a tough spot in that situation, including Marvel, to be fair. Um, they, they, they're they not, I mean, they're in control of it in a way, but like, yeah, they have to really talk to people. If they want to make a sweeping change as like those in comics, they have to think about how it's going to reverberate through a lot more than just their comic that maybe sells 40K a month, you know, in floppies. So, um, you know, I think it's a, I think it's a tricky, tricky thing. Um, but with a creator owned, people don't see you as replaceable because they, they know it came from your head. So it's like, they either like it or not, but they're not trying to be upset about what you're doing with it. They know it comes from inside you and they look, they seem to look at it very differently. And I'm appreciative of that on the creator own side. It's fantastic. It feels really great, but I do wish people would be a little more, um, you know, like I know you love Carol Danvers. I love Carol Danvers too. And when I say you, I mean like not you guys, but the world um, or you hate her either way, but she's a fictional character and I'm fucking real man. And yeah. <laughs> so like, there's only one of us in our little house you know, drinking our coffee and being called, you know, insane, horrible names on the internet, like, just just weigh it a little bit, like, she's not real, but I am. And like, I'm trying my best, man. <laughs> like, it's a it's a weird scenario to be in. I, I can't even imagine what that feels like. Like, I remember, um, I, I, I don't remember the the creative team. So I apologize. But it was on uh, Harley Quinn, I think. Mm -hmm. And people were upset that like they weren't pushing Harley and poison Ivy at that particular time. Yeah. And it's like, I highly doubt that a, a, a creative team that comes to Harley Quinn. Yeah. Doesn't want to do that. Yeah. So if they're not, there's probably a corporate reason that yeah. has to do with Warner brothers. Yeah. Now Warner brothers discovery that's preventing that from happening. And like, you just have to accept that there's, there's no way around it. I mean, like, listen, get, I get it. Keep, keep fighting for it. Right. Like, you know, we want to see that change. That's ha ha part of how we got here is by people pushing, but mm -hmm. I just think a little more compassion, yeah, especially to the actual people, because let me tell you what, it's, it's not the editor of that comic that you should be getting mad at either. You know, it's not like, it's not like Sarah Brunstad, the editor of Captain Marvel. I mean, we've done our best to bring really great stories to her over the last four years, but you know, it's not like she's in charge of right. yeah. of who Carol Danvers dates. Like it's a it's a big, you know, it's a whole giant system there and it's a lot of moving parts. And like yelling at the person that's most accessible to you probably means that they're the most vulnerable people. And that's why you can get to them. And yelling at them just makes them really sad and feel <laughs> bad. It doesn't change the but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be advocating this stuff it doesn't mean we shouldn't be you know writing articles and creating our own shit that's cool so that i mean i feel like that's one of the biggest motivators to the companies is creating cool you know cool shit that does the things that you want to see doing it in other media proves to them it can be done and that people want to see it and i know that's a tough ask i mean listen i put all of my life into launching black cloak so i know that it's not like something you just dash off like oh i'll just create the things i'd like to see myself i understand it's a tough ask but i do think that that means more than anything it's like you know hunger games makes billions of dollars and suddenly we're more interested in female protagonists in action-based things it's just the way it goes right so that's our best push forward rather than attacking creators in, in my opinion but i I'm obviously have a, a big dog in that fight um I just want to be happy, guys. I don't well, want to cry in my coffee. It'd be nice. <laughs> even as like a even as as a creator working on like uh, you know like a Marvel property, like you've even created some characters there. Like I'm thinking of like Fuse and Ramon and you know West Coast Avengers or uh, or Jeff, who's, who's I'm gonna great. Freak! I started playing Marvel Snap, and the first time I see Jeff, I'm gonna lose my goddamn mind. <laughs> yeah, I just saw that there was a Jeff uh, a Jeff card coming excited about it i just got captain marvel yesterday i was pretty oh, happy that's a fun yeah. one yeah. yeah yeah uh but like so you know it's those new characters that you create where you can you can maybe add that representation that people seek um yeah i mean i certainly out there trying i mean not yeah, exactly not, yeah. i'm not trying to represent the the land shirt community so much but um <laughs> you know 
fuse underrepresented an ally. actually I'd say. <laughs> i created fuse an ally in alloy in um west coast avengers and she's gay and out and was with america for a while and mm-hmm. he's bisexual and i created uh Br- carol danvers sister who her sexuality hasn't been identified i feel like i sort of default to writing everyone bisexual just because i mean it's the marvel universe man like yeah, for real you, you could be in a relationship with a wi- yeah. well you also but you could be in a relationship with like a sentient plant or something like so is gender really the big breaking point like i just feel like the marvel universe is so huge like mm. if you were battling aliens on a daily basis would you really be like mm, eh, not yeah. so much scrolls so much that, like, but but i am yeah. into this alien with doesn't even have <laughs> genitals like i mean you know it just i don't know it just seems uncreative to be like no only these genitals yeah. are only these humans like it just seems weird in such a huge universe you know like the things we've seen that you'd be so but you know some people feel very strongly about it oh it's okay anyway uh l'oreal she's cute giant big arms and blue cree skin and i we did star who's yeah. like sort of looks like carol but is a villain and we did binary which is like a sort of accidental creation by carol so yeah i mean i'm having a good time i we created the living blade in black widow that's my favorite villain i've done in a while for sure um that the way we introduced that villain is great um i wish black widow had done better because like maybe we could have tried to do more of that fun stuff but uh maybe i'll maybe i'll try that trick again on something down the line but we basically in that black widow arc because we were going to have alternate we had to have an alternate artist it was only a four issue arc but we had to have an alternate artist for one arc for one issue sorry so we started the story with elena casa grande drawing it it ends on a cliffhanger of black widow facing off with a guy that we've never heard of before who's a new creation but it's implied in the last panel that she knows him she just they sort of standing like mexican standoff kind of thing uh and the and they say each other's name and then the next issue the whole issue is just a flashback fight scene of the first time they met by an alternate artist it's got these crazy like taunt period specific Jordi Belair colors on it it's really cool and then and then it just cuts back right into the story as if that was like just a a snap in their mind and then they start fighting in the present and like it's two more issues to wrap it up but um it was a really great way to introduce a villain. It was super fun. And I think it landed really well. Like I, we were worried about it. I was worried about it, but it, it, it lands. I it was so happy. That book was great alchemy. It's one of those things where mm. you get all the things that I was talking about together. Right. But you know, you just don't get to go indefinitely. <sighs> it's just how it goes. Well, that's unfortunate to hear because black widow Black Widow is a character who I feel like has had some some pretty decent uh, runs, mm-hmm. like uh, the Edmondson run. I really loved. Um, Wade did some stuff. So the Wade but, Samney stuff was good. Also the Marjorie yeah. Lou one. That's a little older, yeah, but that yeah. stuff with Akuna yeah. is very good. She never sits to go very long though. I think the Nada one is the longest. The uh, Edmondson. And and so, but yours really blew me away because I was like, well. You know, I've read a lot of Black Widow stuff that was really good. You know, what more is there with this character? And then you shut me up. <laughs> and and I but I appreciate that because it's like, no, there is no limitation on any character and certainly not one who hasn't had that many opportunities at bat. So when you, you know, stepped into the uh, position to write Black Widow, um, what were some of the goals that you had with this character? And was there any like additional pressure because of the frankly, like really strong runs that have come before? So I had actually pitched um, black widow like a year before that they came back to me and I'd pitched it to Jake um, who was an editor there who I loved um, who moved to the West coast and he's with humanoids now he's incredible. Um, but so it did, it just didn't go. I don't know. They were already working on something for her or I don't know. It wasn't, it just wasn't going to happen. And so about a year later, Sarah Brunstad, who's my editor on Captain Marvel, um, you know, that run was going really well. And I was at a place with Marvel where they were really bringing me a lot of choice stuff and asking me to do it. And she's like, all right, so black widow. And I was like, 
oh no i was because that's a character i really wanted i really had been gunning for her i mean so much so that i'd put in a pitch a year before they hadn't gone anywhere which is not something i typically do with them ever since the Mm -hmm. since the beginning in the beginning i was doing like bake-offs and pitching but after that you know i think you know sometimes sometimes being one of the few girls is a bonus in that they if they like you and they think you're doing good work and they have something big they're well let's put you know, let's put Kelly on it. So um, I think that's how Black Widow sort of came about. And I looked at her and I was like, okay, but there's a, we have to get something out of the way, right? I was like, I'm not doing any Red Room shit. And she was like, she was like, she was like, oh, she's like, okay. She's like, I'm into that. I was like, are you? I was, she's like, you do not like it. I was like, no, no, it's great. I was like, but it's every story. Like, I'm over it. Like, let's move on. I don't want to see any more ballerinas. I don't want to, like, I'm, I've had it, you know, like, we can hmm. go back to it at some point, but let's break her out of there. Like, I've got a whole, I've got a whole Black Widow as Batman in San Francisco thing. Like, let's do it, you know? And so um, she was super into it. And so that's where it came from. And and it really was just, I like the Red Room, but I'm sick of, why does every sentence we have about Natasha have to also talk about the Red Room? I And it wasn't even that I didn't use, I used some characters who were related to that. I mean, I used Alexi a little bit and I, the Red Guardian, and I used the the great character that Samney and Wade had introduced um, and I brought him back and things. So, you know, I'm not opposed to the Red Room as an idea. I just thought, look, there's a lot more fertile stuff for, for her to explore. Like, let's go out and like, create some some nemeses for her and 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 i did this story of like a new i so she's got a kid in the first arc that's a pretty big spoiler anyone who's listening i apologize um but then you know yeah in the second arc lucy sort of becomes a stand-in you know people people were angry at me for not using red widow or some other pre-existing characters that i was like guys there's a very specific theme to this character which is that black widow doesn't have this son and so here's this kid who she can stop before she becomes a villain or a superhero or whatever she's trying to like course correct it's very much like a mothering transfer of emotion here and um you know you feel bad when people ask questions like that because you're like ah shit i didn't i didn't do it like i didn't they didn't get it completely you know so i i feel Mm. like there's a little bit of a failure there but i'm really proud overall of black widow i i think it's beautiful it's it's one of my favorite books it's really really phenomenal and i i I, it is a shame uh that it like according to you that it didn't do as well that sucks um, and if you're listening, like, go give this a chance. You will be blown away. I, I, I genuinely believe you'll be blown away by the art. Like, mm. the art is crazy. It's so good. And I feel like, I don't know if this is literally true, but it feels like every issue had just an explosive uh, splash page. like a Yeah, double, a double yeah. page spread. Yeah, yeah. Elena Casagrande. Elena Casagrande on most art, although we mm-hmm. had some very good fill-ins in Rafael de la Tour, um, and um, Carlos Gomez. Oh, oh my God! Well, Carlos, yes, Carlos Gomez did do some cool um, flashback stuff, like that was in a sort of different POV that was very actiony. That was fun. There was also, um, oh my God, I'm so sorry, I'm forgetting his name. The guy who did the Living Blade issue, which is so cool, is also Raphael, but I'm blanking on his last name. I'm so sorry, Raphael. Anyway, um, as if they're listening. Um, so, uh, and then Jordi Belair did Colors Throughout, which was really incredible. And um, yeah, we did a, we did in issue one, we did this really incredible um, DeLuca effect uh double page spread action sequence Mm. which so deluca just for anyone who doesn't know it's when you get multiple figures of one character throughout the same panel so you're seeing black widow in an action scene and you're seeing her multiple times like in here she's kicking a guy and here she's flipping and here she's you know hitting him with a cast iron pan or whatever and it's all within one panel So that's a technique that I really like. And for someone like um, Elena, who's a really explosive artist, who's got these beautiful, clean lines, and for a character like Black Widow, who's a more of a ground level fight character, you can create these incredible choreographed scenes, I mean, if you're willing. And so in every issue, uh, we have one of those double page action spreads. A couple of them are 
not technically DeLuca effect, but they're similar enough that they have the same vibe where she's actually using panels more. But yeah, we got we got a reputation for doing these. And um, it was really fun to be writing a badass Black Widow book with an all female team, except for Clayton. Love you, Clayton, uh, the letterer. <laughs> um and to be like the one of the most violent like cool actiony books um on the stands was really fun and to also win an Eisner for it it was crazy uh Elena had a young child a young son at the time when we were first working on Black Widow and like during the pandemic and she told me he calls her the lady who fights <laughs> seems right it seems right <laughs> whenever she was working so so with those action pages do you do you choreograph them yourself when you when you're writing them because i know you you did something similar with the deluca effect in uh, hawkeye with uh leo romero i do it on basically all my books yeah. unless yeah. there's something where it really doesn't work like like it's jeff it doesn't i haven't done it on it's jeff for example um and I don't do it that often on Captain Marvel. I've done it a couple times. Lee Jarbe did it for us in the last Avenger run and things like that. But it works better in a more ground level fight scene. Stuff like the 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 spectacle you need for a Carol Danvers fight is just different kind of yeah. spectacle than you need for Black Widow. So I like seeing what art is part of the fun of the DeLuca effect. I love it as a storytelling technique and like a really great impact. But one of the most exciting things to me is doing it with different artists. And then also doing it with Elena was the first time I got to see someone do it over and over and over again, because we started with one and we did it for every issue. And her, I mean, just her commitment to it and her constantly trying to outdo herself created such incredible spreads and such amazing moments. Um, but uh, I, you know, we did it on Mr. or Mrs. X with Deadpool and Gambit. Like, I just, I just, I just love it. I can't remember what the question was. I'm sorry. Well, it's a very comic specific thing to do too. Mm. You know? Oh, so, yeah. oh, I, what, wh how specific I write it. Right. That was the sure. thing. Yeah. So I would say probably more detailed than you would think, but yeah. typically mm -hmm. what I do is I start out and I explain what we're doing. I'm like, hey, if you're into it, like we've got one next week in Captain Marvel that Javier Pina did um, for Hazmat and uh, Wolverine, Laura Wolverine in the Captain Marvel book. And it's so cool. It's so cool. But so when I approach it, so um, Javier and I have worked together a little bit, but not as much as Elena. But so I go to him in the script and I go, all right. Here's what I want to do. If you're into it, you know, DeLuca effect, like here's the idea. And then in his case, if he was willing to do it, I basically, I was like, so I'm going to write down the suggestions of what these actions should be and like what the beats we need are. And then, you know, do, you know, follow it a little bit, but if you have better ideas, absolutely, whatever. So I would say that with everyone, it sort of starts out like that. And I'll give, I'll be more detailed when we start and I'll loosen up the more I do it. So like, you know, Black Widow 1 was written super tight. And by the time we're at Black Widow 15, that's super loose because she knows what she wants and I know what I want. So it's like that. But that's, I would say that's indicative of, of a script period. Like, you know, the more I've worked with you, the less I'm going to have to be super specific about, you know, this, 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 and how many panels we need and whatever. Although for any of my artists I'm working with, even if it's the first time, I always say, like, I write pretty tight scripts, but I'm completely open to your suggestions if we're missing things or whatever, like, you know, they know best. I'm just mm -hmm. trying to give them a roadmap for them to draw the best thing, right? Yeah, we actually had a, had one of our, our, our listeners, Sultan of Swing, actually ask specifically about the collaboration process with uh, uh, Kesegron and Black Widow. So that's yeah. – uh, we actually had a, a lot of the buzz in the Discord was about Black Widow from what I remember. Mm -hmm. Everyone I feel like, like yeah. that's definitely one of my most beloved books, which I love because, um, you know, so like the sales weren't necessarily there. But, I mean, listen, we won the Eisner. We got a lot of great reviews. Yeah. It's one of the best reviewed Black Widow books that's ever come out. I just, I just think it's, it's beautiful. It was the, it was the most fun I've had doing comics, you know, corporate comics. It was, uh, it really just felt like, 
it, the closest thing it felt like when I was first doing Hawkeye with Leo Romero and Jordy, um, mm. that I was aware, even though that was only the second thing I was doing at Marvel and only like my third or fourth thing ever in comics, as I was doing it, I was like, this is it. This is the dream. And I'm, I don't know <laughs> if I'm ever going to get this. Like, this is happening very early in my career for it to come together like this. And I'd already had really good experiences on Captain Marvel and the Carol Corps with David Lopez and Kelly mm -hmm. Sue DeConnick. I, I was doing Gem, which was really fun and sometimes a dream come true. Like with Sophie Campbell, I was having a super good time. Mm -hmm. But that Le there was just something magical right from the jump with the Leo, Jordy, Sana, Charles team. And I was like, eh, I might never get this again. And I think it was, and I've had a lot of good teams between them that were a lot of things that I was really excited about. But I do think it was the Black Widow coming together again that felt like the closest to I'd, what I'd had on that Hawkeye team. So it was hard to lose it. And both books only went for about 15 or 16 issues. So apparently that's my sweet spot. <laughs> well, that's how long you can keep the team together. <laughs> I, I would say your Captain Marvel, Marvel run is, is uh, uh, disputing that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, well, I still think my, I, I mean, this is the outlier, right? Captain Marvel's sure, the yeah, outlier. Yeah. I've never come close before to this. We're headed toward 50. Yeah. It's very cool. It's very exciting. But but Captain Marvel is a different animal sure. because every mm. arc you have to basically change up the creative team. Like to meet the schedule, like you either have to write differently so that you have shorter four issue arcs with one or two issue breaks between them. Or you have to sort of reinvent the wheel every five to six issues with a new artist. And, you know, mm. so we've been lucky enough to have really great people come back. You know, we had Carmen Canero for the first like eight or whatever. And then we had Lee Jarbet did two runs. And then um, Sergio Davila is also doing two runs. So it's been great. And even when we didn't have them, we've had, you know, some of the one-offs have been some of my favorite issues. David Lopez did a one-off issue and, um, um, oh, gosh, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the artist's name. Did an amazing issue with Binary and Photon and Captain Marvel mm -hmm. that was, you know, beautifully colored. Um, and Corey Smith did a great run. So they've all been great, but they feel a little disparate to the way Hawkeye feels like one thing. Even though there are a couple yeah. issues in there drawn by Michael Walsh, it just feels more contained. Whereas Captain Marvel feels very like unwieldy to me a little bit when I look at it. Um, but part of that is just trying so many things. I mean, we did a whole weird arc in there where we separated the story and separated the artists so that we were using a really great, like really European style guy doing the Carol story. And then like a very traditional superhero guy, Juan Fergari, doing the um doing the superhero stuff and it was like a super weird story that nobody would have ever let us do if it was in year one of captain marvel but because it was issue 38 like you know it was like let's try it let's let's try to keep it interesting and really take carol on a journey you know and push her to her limits so it's been fun but it's a different animal you know yeah. I mean, I, I would say it's working because I, I, I think, are you the longest writer on a solo ongoing at Marvel currently? Like it's. Uh, it's out oh, of... currently, currently, probably. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Because I think only um, I think only a Martel Hulk went to 50 recently yeah, yeah. in the last, you know, five or 10 years or whatever it is. So, yeah. No, listen, <laughs> it's been great. I mean, and we had some help from the movie, especially at the beginning. But to be honest, um, they almost canceled us at um, 10. So the movie wasn't helping us then. It was, honestly, it was Star. Whatever happened with Star in issue eight, it gave the book a whole new life. And people got really excited about the things we were doing. I mean, it was just like a weird, almost like a frenzy of people getting yeah. excited about it. It was like collector people, but also... The fans, it was a little strange, but it really, it really juiced our sales for whatever reason. And then um, issue 12 was the start of the last Avenger arc, which got a lot of publicity and a lot of people loved it, but also people were very mad. Like, you know, how dare she hurt Thor? I don't know, whatever. So, you know, uh, <laughs> it know. sounds hurt, right. Yeah, yeah. Hurt, yeah. hurt Thor and his little feelings, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't know. Uh, oh yeah go ahead sorry no 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 i just 
Uh, it's like C- Captain Marvel is is maybe like in my mind, based on kind of what people say, one of the most divisive characters right now. Yeah. Um. Mm. Yeah. I wonder and, why. <laughs> well. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Of course, people are dumb. But um, <laughs> what do you think people most misunderstand about Captain Marvel? I think I hmm. think all characters are sometimes written badly. And I think Carol, like all characters, has had some examples of that. And it's not that the writing was bad. It was that they were forced into a position where they had to then sort of be written out of character for it to work or to be written more out of character than, than I would think it to work. And, you know, it it happened a lot on civil war too, but honestly it happened a little bit on civil war too. I mean, I think that's when people first started because that's when she tried to arrest Anya Corazon, I Mm. think was in civil war, which people really had a problem with. And I agree agree i don't like it i that that's not my carol but you know i've been writing the character for four years so of course i feel that way like i you know Mm. i I don't want to be in the head of a character for four years who's supposed to be her hero who arrests vulnerable (laughs) minority superheroes that she's Mm. training like it's just it's a very (laughs) it's not good it's not good i do see why carol gets put into those roles sometimes you know first of all she's an incredibly powerful character and she's also got a military background which i think Mm. naturally makes her i don't know i guess in america we would say we we lean that towards conservative although i feel like that's breaking down a little bit these days which is good but you know military implies to me more of willingness to work with the government willingness to agree with the government or to you know go along or whatever and i think carol's breaking out of that a bit as and part of that is deliberate and part of that is just accidental i'm not a big military person i'm not a big war story person with unless you're using superheroes i'm not you know so so while i've tried to keep that a core part of her i don't lean super into it you know like kelly sue DeConnick has a lot more military stuff in hers that i think is very accurate uh and and great but it comes from she's just more familiar with it it's more natural to her to to write her that way i think um so anyway people have problems with civil war and civil war ii but i just i mean it's just an excuse because you you can point to any character having this happen to them and if you didn't have a problem with a woman being one of the most powerful characters in the Marvel universe, I I think most of those people wouldn't be trotting out the atrocities committed during Civil War and Civil War II. I mean, I just I just think it's an excuse and it's a pretty lame one, honestly. <laughs> like it's weak. It's weak. Sorry, I shouldn't have said lame. It's weak. Um I I think that just be honest. You don't like her because it doesn't fit some idea you want to have i don't i don't know i don't know but it's it's crazy i mean think of how i mean think of any character that you've loved and then try to think of a time that they were written poorly where you're like oh that's not that's not <laughs> that's not luke cage luke cage would never say that or do that or be that guy you know i mean it happens to all of them um i hate it when some of my pet characters that i love are like going in a different direction. I mean, and sometimes I just don't read books because I'm like, sure. oh, I don't like where that's yeah. going. Um, you know, I got, I one of my favorite people in comics, one of my best friends in comics is Matt Rosenberg. Mm. And one time we were in uh, the Marvel Summit together and he was talking about a project that was going to put Jessica Jones back in a superhero costume. And it was a good idea like it wasn't a Jessica Jones book. It was just like part of another book and she was going to be in a superhero costume. And I always want to support Matt always. And I couldn't do it. I was like, why? I was like, I was like, I get it. I get that it doesn't sell enough as a detective book and her in jeans and a, and a leather jacket. I get it. 
So people want to put her back in a superhero costume, but I just, it feels so wrong to me. I was like, I just don't like it. I didn't like it. I didn't even like it when Bendis did it on Avengers. Like I was excited to see Jessica on Avengers, but it just feels wrong to me for her to be there. Like she doesn't belong there, you know? You mentioned um, here. She should be the oil to the to the system's water. You know what I mean? Like she's <laughs> supposed to, she's supposed to disrupt, you know? Um, anyway. You mentioned uh, Rosenberg. Is that why Star shows up in Thunderbolts there? Uh, <laughs> I think he just thought she had a little heat on her and she was interesting. Yeah. And she was in a great place for Thunderbolts, I thought, because even though I was writing her as a straight villain, I guess because of the white costume, people kept wanting to make her a hero. They huh. kept like, I mean, I kept getting this like hero and there are some of her actions so far. You could maybe say anti-hero in a few cases, but she's a fucking villain, man. Yeah, and so him wanting to use her on Thunderbolts, I thought was really interesting and cool because it can still push her both ways. And yep. I, I ended up thinking that book was really fun. Um, Me too. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard to do much in three issues, but he really, he really did. Let's um let's shift gears a little bit and talk about uh Mr. and Mrs. X and just the <laughs> stuff you've been able to do with Rogue and Gambit in general. Uh you've talked about how those are like two of your favorite characters and like you know you've always been so into them. So in your wildest dreams like did you did you ever see you being able to write stories for Rogue and Gambit like no. It's crazy. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, you're talking about a kid who I was so into Rogan Gambit when I was like 15 or something that when I was buying my comics, I would, if there was an issue where they had like, like issue 24, where they like went on their date, like I had a framed copy of that in my room. And then I had bought an extra copy that I had like cut up and made a collage. I was just, <laughs> I was in love. I was in love. So the idea that I would one day be charting their course or like putting them yeah. on course for something is crazy. I will say that um, it's the story of how I got Rogan Gambit was um, a great example of sometimes bad things lead to good things because I basically got fired off of something yeah. at Marvel and not fired because nobody was mad at me. I hadn't done anything wrong. It just like, wasn't working. It wasn't the right fit for the story they had in mind for my idea that I had pitched. It just wasn't gelling. But <laughs> Even though I think it's very common and people shouldn't be upset about it, it feels like getting fired because you had a job and now it's been taken away. But <laughs> when they, when we were talking about it, it was Axel at the time, you know, he was like, listen, we feel really bad that this didn't work out. You know, what do you, what do you like? What do you want? What do you got your eye on? And so I rattled off a few things, including he, I think he specifically also said, including the ex office, like, you know, what do you, and I was like, well, Rogan Gambit are like my favorite characters. And he was like, oh, he's like, that's interesting. He's like, yeah, we might be having something come up for them or an opening for them. I was like, well, I'd love to be considered. And then, yeah, a few weeks later, it was Darren, the editor of Rogan Gambit, reaching out um, to, to have me pitch for it. And, you know, I, we started out with, um, I was like, yeah, it should just be like a really fun, like heisty something, right? You know, really fun, big picture, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, okay, great. How about next week? And I was like, sure. So I went off and I like reread a lot of the old stuff and read about a, a bunch of stuff I hadn't read. And I came back with a pitch that was like eternal sunshine of the spotless mind meet superheroes a little bit it was like very esoteric and weird and he was like i'm not saying i don't like this but what happened to super fun hijinks <laughs> and i was <laughs> i was like what happened is i went and reread that shit and read a bunch of new shit and a we have a lot of cleaning up to do and b um, let's do something different because I don't want to just rehash what these two people have been going through for the last 20 years or 15 years, whatever it was. I was like, we got to do something different. If we want anyone to pay attention to us, we need to do something different. And I was we like, can, we yeah. can have fun when we earn it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Only after we eat our vegetables, Darren. That's right. Um, we famously 
um, he also famously said to me, who wants to see people in therapy? And I was like, me, everyone, me too. especially <laughs> Rogan Gambit. I was yeah. like, are you kidding me to be a fly on the wall of superhero therapy? What is wrong with you if you don't want to see that? Especially with like a crazy couple like Gambit and Rogue who have so much baggage and shit to work through. So yeah, that was how we sort of ended up there. We we did some really cool shit in there. We broke some boundaries a little bit. Prey Perez did a pretty great job with a really tough task. Um, you know, there's a whole section where there's clones and things. So it's like drawing a million Rogue and Gambits. But we really got to pay with their powers and their memories and a lot of stuff. And honestly, it's one of the runs people talk to me about the most. A little bit less lately for some reason but um yeah people really feel like that i i talked to a lot of people who they came back to comics for that book wow. which is a really honor which is a really high honor because i've been that guy too i've been that reader walking dead brought me back to comics years ago mm. um you know we all have those moments where we drift away and come back because of something that excites us so I mean, knowing that there are a million Rogue and Gambit fans out there, well, maybe not a million, but who felt like I did when they were 15 and like were really gratified to read that book, you know, it was good. It was good. One of the things that jumps out to me about, you know, your your takes on, on those two is like, even for a Marvel book, you kind of let them be be sexy. You know what I mean? Like, usually that kind God, of- gets, they have to be. They, I know, they should be, but they're like Rogue sometimes- They're Gambit. If they're not agreed. sexy, who is sexy, right? We got a problem. <laughs> So, but yeah, I was a little surprised with what we were able to get away yeah, with. Yeah. Um, I know Darren and the, there's a, there's a pretty sexy scene in like a, where they're swimming. And so they're in swimsuits and whatever. It's a lot of glistening bodies and stuff. And he's like, well, I don't know about this ass shot. I was like, uh, you know, on Rogue, I was like, I mean, I would agree with you, but are you missing Gambit's ass shot, which is also his balls? <laughs> I was like, I think we're fine. I mean, as far as equal opportunity objectification goes, I think we're cool. Yeah. And he go, and he looked back at it and he goes, oh my God, he goes, I wonder if that's going to get through s and I was like well we're gonna find out here we go <laughs> i mean that's that's uh, historical x-men you know the swimsuit special like that's, I mean, that's yeah more. i mean yeah you know we were they were supposed to do a swimsuit edition on the anniversary and i was the i was like number one cheerleader in the room and i think they're always afraid of that stuff because you know they they've moved really forward in the objectification stuff yeah. but they still struggle to understand and by they i mean the world i don't know people who make comics i don't know they struggle to understand the difference between it's not that nobody can be sexy it's that not everybody should all be the exact same kind of sexy. Mm -hmm. Jessica Jones can be sexy in her cool combat boots and her reasonable non-revealing clothing uh. and still look like a badass in her jeans and leather jacket. And then Elsa Bloodstone and White Queen can be crazy Roger Corman style porn. It's okay. <laughs> That's okay. As long as they're not all Roger Corman style yeah. porn stars, that's the problem. Like that, it's it, and it also a little bit is that women are based more on like porn stars and actresses, while men tends to be based on athletes. And yeah. there should maybe we should still maybe continue shifting a little bit that way. But it's not that the it was never that people don't want to see sexy shit of course we do of course we want to see people looking great in spandex like i don't know where it came, became an argument that we don't want to see that we just want it to be a little more equal and we want it to where it comes represented from would be a nice you know to be a little more um but you know i have to give artists a lot of credit because their jobs are incredibly, incredibly difficult. And it used to be that you could just draw everyone looking the same. So it's a much harder bar these days, I think, where they really have to think about, you know, these shapes and forms and what they're saying with what they're doing. You know, it's not so much just bang out a superhero comic. You're saying a lot more. I mean, which is a nice full circle way to come back to what we were talking about. There's multiple levels to this shit, you know? It's not just shiny superheroes punching other shiny supervillains, you know? And, and Kelly, were you the one that made Gambit a cat dad? <laughs> I did not, okay. but I did pick up that baton and run with it. Gotcha, okay. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I, I that, cool that, that happened in... Uh, 
I want to say that was X Factor, the, okay. the okay. Peter David stuff when they were like working at Serval Industries or whatever. I think that's where it first oh, came out with the okay. cats. I think. Maybe it maybe actually feel uh, relatable to Gambit uh, for once. So that was good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a good humanizing exactly, trait. Yeah. Um, people are, people were always asking me about like, well, they're never home. How are those cats going to survive? And I was like, do you think, do you think any X-Men have cats that aren't like street cats that can take <laughs> care of themselves that are like, oh, hey, they didn't come back from that dimension for three weeks. I guess I better take care of myself. I mean, yeah, these are survivor animals. <laughs> and, and I got to imagine Krakoa has like one D-list mutant who's like the the pet walker. The and pet, like the I mean, sitter, honestly, yeah. I would love to see that one shot. It's like, it's just guy. Glob Herman. It's the, just Glob. Yeah, yeah, the, the, uh, <laughs> The pet whisperer on Krakoa was taking <laughs> care of all these pets. Power, I would totally, yeah. I would totally uh, read that comic. <laughs> Maybe just a one shot though. <laughs> so that that brings us into um, our our next listener question. This one's from Kefis, who says, "Man, I'm a huge fan. A lot of your runs involve both really defining a character, but also building out a found family for them. I'm thinking Captain Marvel, Jessica Jones, A-Force, and a bit for Rogue and Gambit. Is that a theme that means a lot to you, or is it just a natural extension of how you tell stories? Thank you, Kevin. I think it's, I think it's, yeah, thanks. That's a great question. I think it's probably a bit of both. Um, I, I love, I think like a lot of us in comics, I mean, maybe we're all just misfits, but I think we respond pretty powerfully to found family narratives, uh, creating your own family of misfits, um, you know, because you don't feel you fit in or just because you're far from home. I just think it's a good narrative. It's certainly baked very um, much into the X-Men, but I'm a pretty big fan of it. I also really like sisterhood. I like the idea of people sharing power. Um, you know, a big part of Carol of our run for Carol was bringing her back to earth, which feels very wrong in a lot of ways. I mean, she is a character that always wants to go up. Cosmic is a big part of her. So grounding her doesn't feel great, but a, we told plenty of space stories while we were here and B, I just felt she was really disconnected from like her supporting cast and her sort of found families and stuff. I love those stories with her out in space, but for when it came time for me to do it, I felt like I needed to reconnect her with her humanity a little bit. And a lot of that was building out a strong cast for her, which has been really fun, especially because we had such a nice long run for the first time ever. I've been able to bring villains back and bring supporting characters back and like help them solidify. Um, I think my only regret is I wish we'd been able to do a little more with Hazmat, um, I'm very proud that in this brood arc, she's getting a little more focus, but, um, you know, I really wanted, it's a character I love. I didn't want to see her lost and to the, to the publishing <laughs> sands of time. <laughs> and so I sort of put her in there and I'm glad if that's helped her limp along, but I worry that if I didn't do enough with her in four years, when I leave, maybe, yeah. maybe nobody else picks her up. And well, so maybe I didn't do enough. Well, out of the Avengers Academy people, she's the only one with the Marvel Snap card. So that is true. And she so. just got me yesterday. Oh. <laughs> you got hit with that Luke, Luke Cage hazmat combo, I bet, huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. That's I mean, let's so talk funny. about Wong being like the most powerful card in the deck. I can't wait till I get Wong. Let's not, because then people will know how to counter me. So. <laughs> I actually just got Wong and go. like it changed my life. Yeah. Ugh, that that was me for um oh I'm giving away my secrets now. I'm sure you guys <laughs> I've only been playing for a week, so I'm sure you guys know all my secrets. But the uh white tiger Odin combo. Ooh, sure. Fun yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah. Love yep. that. Pool one, pool two, you can't do too much better than that. Boy, we just turned into such nerds. <laughs> although, although, if you guys, I've never, I don't have any friends on it yet, so you guys should probably text me a code so I can play with you in battle that mode. Yeah. That would be awesome. I would love <laughs> Tec- to do that. I would totally. I've never done it before because I was like, oh, I can create my own. And I was like, oh, no, you have to have a friend and I don't have any friends. <laughs> I was like, I can't play this with anyone. You've got three comics, pal. Two comics, pal. <laughs> Sean and I have talked about maybe streaming it too. So like it can maybe be some, be some fun here. Yeah. So I, I, 
I've been dying to talk to you about the fact that you used to work for CBR. Oh, like, I I think that is so fascinating. What a what a what a response to that. Oh, <laughs> That's, that that'd be that response is like what someone would ask for our old company. Is uh, oh <laughs> no. <Well. laughs> so so you were there from. 2009 to like 2015 right yeah and you wrote reviews but you also had the she has no head column yes and, i yes yeah. um sorry go ahead no no you go you go i i was so curious as to what it's like for you to go from reviewing comics and we do that we've done we do that on the podcast but we also used to do it you know for websites and stuff so like i get that part of it but you're now you've you've crossed over like mm -hmm. so how like does the fact that you used to review books impact the way you write like did you learn things from reviewing comics so much 100 percent. okay the most qualified people to write comics in my opinion if they have any writing talent or artist talent or are interested in it are people who review comics you learn more from reviewing comics than anything any school can teach you. That's oh, let me put a cap. Let me put an asterisk on that. If you're reviewing comics correctly, because a right. lot of reviews are not really, I don't know. A lot of reviews are like a plot summary or some feelings about some <laughs> things. Like, well, I hate Captain Marvel, so one star, you know, or like whatever. Like you, there's a lot of that stuff. But we're talking about real reviews. Real reviews that like weigh the content, talk about the metaphors, talk about the art that explain why something is great and powerful and also why something doesn't work and why it's not a good book. The, uh, reading comics and then forcing yourself to think critically about them and evaluate not only if you liked it or not, but why mm. is it's everything. It's everything. Um, I don't want to say that just because you can do that, you can um, write a great script for example <laughs> I was criticizing the shit out of this movie the other night <laughs> and going why isn't this movie better I'm so angry and yet I've yet to write a great movie let alone have one made so there's a million steps between those things but if you can read and critically assess stuff you're dealing with you're on the path towards getting there if you're on the path towards understanding how to write that i learned i love scad i would never change my two couple years that i was there i learned a lot i had a lot of great people around me and it continued to stoke my fire for being in comics but boots on the ground what taught me more was reviewing comics for CBR and I also did it for Publishers mm -hmm. Weekly and writing op-eds that were like, you know, taking things apart and like analyzing them. All of that stuff helped me so much. And then podcasting, which I did for a little while, um, that that also helped talking to creators, hearing about their process and everything. But I would say that more practically connected me to people. Like I met right. more mm -hmm. editors, especially because I'm someone who doesn't do the con circuit and go to bars all the time to like meet people and stuff. I'm more digital online only mostly. So that that was really helpful to me that I was able to meet some editors and, you know, I was charming enough that I would they were willing to talk to me some more and I mean I think one of the first inroads I had toward Marvel like I ended up coming in sort of through a different door but the initial door was that I interviewed an editor there for a podcast and we had a really great connection and I was a big fan of her stuff and we just sort of kept talking afterwards and eventually I asked her if I could submit a pitch for something like what was the process what do I do and so there were like some forms I had to sign and then eventually I was allowed to send the pitch and she eventually looked at it and I think it did end up making its way to sauna because it was eventually what became Hawkeye um, my Hawkeye run um, it was Hawkeye investigations in my pitch but it became Hawkeye um, and um, that I I sort of ended up coming instead through Kelly Sue DeConnick mm -hmm. for Captain Marvel and the Carol Corps for just she needed a co-writer. And so I think that's how it came in. But then what happened was once I got in, Sana was the editor on that. And so we synced up on the Hawkeye pitch and that's it. 
Got it. So we should interview you know? more editors. Got it. Edit- interview <laughs> more and editors. <laughs> and I think the thing that's so annoying to hear, but that is very big part of it, is make work. Yeah. You know, um, I was doing some creative, how I got gem, which was the thing that helped Marvel believe that I could do this. I got gem because I'd been doing heart in a box with Meredith McLaren, my artist on black cloak. And I mean, we had like a hundred pages done or something, but because it's a graphic novel, you know, it takes a long time to finish it, but I was able to send IDW like, a hundred pages of great comics and be like, I know this isn't out yet, but here's the proof I can do it. And they were like, Oh yeah, looks great. And then, so I was able to be in the running for that pitch, which I had Sophie Campbell with, and she was like a, she was like having a ringer. So that was good. Um, And yeah, so they, they picked our pitch and then that opened another door and, you know, so it's basically like a series of never ending doors and just try not to fuck up before you jam your foot in the next one that opens, you know, it's like a, but all my scripts are late now. So (laughs) yeah, but you're in the door. Like it doesn't, you know, it's they fun. Can't, I'm pretty sure they can open it and forcibly shove you back out of it. <laughs> but I mean, TBD, I'll let you know. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm endlessly fascinated by that. I think, um, I think I became a, I think I became like a more aware comics reader when I started doing this, yeah. and I didn't realize how unaware of certain things I was. Before yeah. I was like responsible for telling other people what I thought and yeah. then receiving feedback on what I thought. Like, wait, you've, you're have you telling me you have thoughts about what I think? I got to <laughs> tighten up. I got to yeah. tighten the fuck up. Uh, <laughs> it, it evolves past uh, who wins in a fight, you know, Goku versus Superman in a comic shop. Right. It's like, all right, well, let's yeah. actually talk about yeah. you know, subtext yeah. for once. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's, let's try to get a, a couple more, uh, listener questions in here. I want to, I want to get Ooh, the, qu- uh, the, sorry, quickly oh, sorry, uh, yeah. from the Twitch chat. Uh, we had Dan Trudeau say, uh, he loved, she has no head and he looked forward to every, uh, every column. So, uh-huh. uh, yeah, so you had at least two readers. <laughs> <laughs> I think I had a lot of readers because, um, that column, I mean, that column, I, I should say that. I mean, I think that a lot of people were aware i mean i was writing that like i became friends with a lot of creators who were like scott snyder and i became friends because he read a few of my pieces and he read a few of my reviews and he was interested in what i was saying about batman and you know this that Hmm. and the other but it also made me a ton of enemies i mean people Hmm. people want to know why i don't uh go on signings and why we don't see my face right now I'm a fat working woman working in comics and uh, I get enough. I get enough abuse. Like let's it's, it's, I just don't want to add to it. You know, like I want to engage with people. I want to do it, but I don't want to have to put all my privacy and all of that. Like that's a big, it's a big trade off. And I got to tell you, I, <laughs> every year I really do want to do some of these things though. Like it's hard to resist and I weigh it every time, honestly, like, risk versus reward like should I do it or whatever and I've especially post pandemic I was like man I'd really like to try and get out there and uh seeing all the like deep fake porn shit that's happening too now I'm like yep maybe maybe not a good time to make changes (laughs) about how much how I put my myself out there like it's just um you know a lot of people really I mean I I had a stalker I had a stalker guy when I was doing she has no head Sue and I both um this guy i mean it it got so bad for me and many other women it wasn't just me that mark miller got involved like i I mean it it was insane like it was crazy and and i mean in a good way like he was trying to help um sorry (laughs) i should clarify yeah no he was trying to he was trying to help he became aware i don't remember it might have been through heidi at the beat like because she was getting it too like Mm. with this guy i mean um but this Mark became aware of this guy and like he tried to help. And honestly, he did more than anyone else that we had talked to and it it did help. Um, But it was also the first peak for me pretty early on in my career at, wow, this is dark and this is bad. And I don't know how much I want to subject myself to this. Um, 
I just want to write good comics. Like, yeah. I just want to make comics, man. <laughs> like, it shouldn't have to come with this price tag, you know? That's fucking heartbreaking. Um, it, that's not something that most people, you know, in the industry have to think about. And it's so annoying and frustrating that, you know, that's something that just comes with the territory yeah. being, a, a you know, a woman in comics. And, like, we just have to do better. It's it's re- It really is bullshit. Like, we, we interviewed Gail Simone. And Gail Simone is the sweetest. Like, she was so nice. And, like, it was so fantastic. Nice. Um, and New York Comic Con, she was gracious with me. She gave me her time. And it's like, why would you... Go in the comment section of something like that and spew hatred. When did that happen? Yeah, it did. Yeah, Ugh. Um, Ugh. it's like why would that be what you would get out of this? I don't understand it. Yeah. But I don't want to. I don't want to linger on that because there are so many people who were excited about the fact that you were coming on here. Mm-hmm. Uh, you 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 don't see it right now, but like for the last hour that we've been chatting. The Twitch and the YouTube have been so complimentary. Oh, uh, that's so nice. On our Discord, they've been talking about Black Widow for literally years. <laughs> that's read so Black nice. Widow, read Black Widow. So, that's so nice. For every asshole that's out there that does <laughs> that type of stuff, there are people like the people in our community that love you and that support what you do and that support people making art. It, yeah. that's what it's about yeah. that's what it should be about. i really i really it is it is sad that there's this toxic thing that runs through it because i do feel like the comics community maybe because all of us ourselves feel like outsiders too like i feel like it's a really beautiful community i love it it's i also feel like comics are such a <laughs> you know they always talk about um kids comics being um lost leaders because mm-hmm. they don't sell well initially like print runs or whatever and to me i'm like that's great you're building a new generation of comics readers take the loss like suck it up it's mm-hmm. it's an investment in the future get over yourself um i mean i say that less to someone like image i say that i think dc and marvel need to take it on the chin a little bit because yeah, they're the big yeah. companies out there. Like, I'm not saying that image needs to be sacrificing every little, you know, and all these smaller companies that are working on razor thin, but for you, the big dogs out there, yes, you guys have a responsibility to help build a younger audience. And so I'm sorry, this book doesn't sell as well as that book, but you, maybe you just made like, I mean, does it's Jeff make, thousands upon thousands of young kids who maybe weren't interested in comics interested in comics like yes do this do more of this anyway um i can't remember what i was gonna say uh that oh the community being so great i just feel like you know so we talk about kids comics being lost leaders within comics but comics within all the mediums feels like the loss leader it feels like the one that's like the least profitable the most sweat equity for like a poor guy in a room somewhere right like and 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 you're doing it for like i don't know a thousand people are reading your book ten thousand fifty thousand i don't know whatever it just the numbers seem so small and the community seems so small when you compare it with these other things but i love that about us i love us that we're like listen Sometimes it doesn't make sense and sometimes they're really bad and sometimes they're brilliant and they change your life and they made you cry on a Saturday afternoon. Like there's just everything. The whole world is in there and it's just such a beautiful medium and you can do anything within it. I just, I just love it so much. And I, I want comics to be better all the time and I want great people to be involved in it. And it does suck that this toxic thing runs through it. And listen, it it runs through all of these things. I'm just more aware of it because this is the pool I play in, but um, mostly it's an amazing community full of people who love this weird thing that, (laughs) you know, even though Marvel's superhero movies and superhero movies and properties in general have become billion dollar properties that all the world knows about, we're still a tiny fraction that, that really know, that really know where this like beautiful little stupid medium is. Um, (laughs) And it's great. It's great. I just wish, yeah, more people could, I don't know. Just t- take your toxic shit and work it out somewhere else. I don't know, man. It's sad. Uh, do uh, what Rogan Gambit did and just go to therapy. A weirdo. <laughs> yeah, go like... to therapy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you guys ever see that? Did you guys ever see that TikTok of a woman 
who her date went to the bathroom and so she picked up his phone and she was like she's like he left his phone open and so she put all these like siri search terms she's like therapy therapy for <laughs> men therapy for adults getting therapy how therapy can make you a better human being like she was trying to fuck up his algorithm for his search terms or whatever and i just thought oh, we should all be in therapy it's, it would be so good for all of us every honestly. one of us honestly we've yeah, been yeah. through so much everyone could use like a, a minute and a little bit of kindness and a little bit of someone caring about what's going on you know and it's just like captain america wouldn't do that you know what i mean like captain yes. america wouldn't mm -hmm. Go on YouTube and write a nasty comment, right? Yes. Like Captain Marvel yes. would not do this, you know. Like I don't, yeah. I don't understand how you can be a fan of these characters who are supposed to embody the best of us in most cases, and then you go out and be the worst version of yourself. That doesn't yeah. compute. Yeah. But also, I love sweat equity. I will use that. That's <laughs> phenomenally funny. That's fantastic. <laughs> Um, so the listeners did have a few more questions that I would love to run through. Uh, so Dan Trudeau uh, also said, uh, for Kelly Thompson, my question is, if she thinks it's realistic anymore to launch a successful creator-owned book, if you hadn't had a good run with the big two to cultivate a larger following, um, what do you what do you feel about that? I think it's, I think, I think it's, I think you can, you can do it anytime at any level and it's valuable experience for you. I think if you're expecting quote unquote big launch, yeah, d then don't, don't expect that if you haven't been doing this for a little while and probably been doing it at some big places where, you know, you're sort of, because here's a good way to think of it, right? It's like when you tweet something, you're like, oh my God, 45,000 people are seeing that. Well, I mean, who knows now how many people right. are seeing it? <laughs> two, two, two people saw it. But <laughs> even in the best of days, it's like, you know, no, they're a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of your 45,000 people are seeing it. And a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of that are the ones who click on the link. So when you're like, Hey man, I sell 50,000 books a month, Captain Marvel. That's great. Only 10,000 of those people are interested in not are interested in you and not Captain Marvel. And only 5,000 of those people will actually remember to look for it. And only 2000 of those people actually put it on their pre-order list. Like, do you, I mean, do you see how, quickly right. like yeah. it starts to fall apart so like you really do have to go out there and build this audience if you expect to pull from it in any significant amount but that doesn't mean you shouldn't make a comic that makes barely any money for you know a year or whatever like it's still good for you if you're making good work you're learning every time you're doing it you're putting you're learning about the industry you're learning about yourself you're learning about working with other people especially artists and how to make those things <laughs> and then you're also putting work out there that you can then point to someone and go no, I'm making comics. Now that's going to go better for you if they're good, but you know, it's, it's good to show that you can do it. I mean, people hate that advice and I get it. It's the hardest part of the advice. You know, it's like, it's like losing weight. Oh, just start, you know, it's like, come on, man, help me out. Like, I, but there's no cheat code here. I wish there was. I mean, you can do a lot of things that will help you along the way. But yeah, I mean, you got to do the work and you got to make the connections. and You got to keep doing it. I mean, what's that? What's that idiom about failure, right? Like you, you're, you only fail if you stop trying, like, you know. I still haven't failed at writing Batman because I'm haven't stopped yet. <laughs> it could happen. We don't know. Um, you know, so if you don't give up, you you didn't fail. You're still trying, you know. That's a great answer, especially when you consider the fact that there are, there are no shortage of, you know, creative people who not necessarily just in comics but across, you know, all industries who make it a little bit later in life. Like, well, I'm one of those. I mean, I'm not going to talk about my age or say my age, but I think I'm older than people probably think. And I think some of that is to my benefit. Like, I'm not going to sit here and be like, I, I many times I think, oh, I wish I was 10 years younger. And at this point in the industry, 
like that would be great but you know something else i think all the time boy i'm really glad kickstarter around wasn't around when i was 22 because i might have put out some really yeah. horrific books mm -hmm. instead the first book i put out was heart in a box and i'm really proud of it even now because i was a little bit older of a creator and i like had a little more like life and writing experience mm -hmm. and all these things and you know so i think it's it's all a matter of perspective right yeah. And, and how you choose, like you could look at that. I could look at that pessimistically and be like, boy, I wish I was 10 years younger. Don't we all, or I can look at it optimistically and be like, well, part of the reason my career feels a little tighter and the, I feel like the quality control is better is because I wasn't really producing work before a certain point, you know? Right. By the time we saw you, you were already good. Yes. I mean, I don't want to say I'm good. But I'm comfortable with you it. said it. So <laughs> affirmative, Sean. <laughs> no. Yes. I, I think that's the gist of it. Sure. Like build that up so that so that you really sort of explode. I mean, let's here. Let's tell a story about me not being good. That'll that'll take take the sense of me being good out of the distaste <laughs> of that out of our mouths. Um, my partner and I wrote a screenplay a couple, two years ago, whatever. And I really love it. And I actually, but my manager doesn't love it. And basically they don't even want to like take it out. Mm -hmm. And my partner and I have talked about this a lot. Like we love this stupid little, it's like a horror comedy thing. It's not supposed to change the world. It's just supposed to be fun and maybe make us a little bit of money. Right. But I think my manager doesn't like what it says for that to be my first screenplay that mm -hmm. we're trying to sell. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like I'm just trying to make a little money and she's like out there trying to protect my brand. And right. sometimes that grates a little bit because I'm like, lady, this is, I want to say bitch, but I don't want my manager to be like, do you call me a bitch on a podcast? I'll be like, bitch, of course <laughs> I did. No, I, I want to be like, I want to be like, um, lady, I don't care about my brand. I just want to get paid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I think, you know, she's taking the long view, which is a little bit what I'm yeah. saying about my comics. Like, I feel like my brand in comics is very well protected. I am very careful that everything comes out with a certain level of quality. And that's just, mm -hmm. you know, and that's I I say to Sarah sometimes I'm my editor on Captain Marvel, which I'm sure she does not appreciate. I'm like, listen, I know I'm always late now, but at least it's always pretty good when you get it and she goes i'll give you that but don't 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 run with it i was like all right i, I tried that but, in my screenwriting classes in college it didn't really work out for me though yeah they don't I mean, care uh, they don't care for it they don't no, care no, for it. It at, all. Yeah. at least it's good and you're nice right like you can't have all three i am nice although yeah. i'm sure if we're talking about colorists my uh my editor would say i'm not nice i complain <laughs> a lot about modern comics coloring i've been very lucky to mostly have people that i really like and really think is good but i don't like like a lot of the really digital high impact high rendering coloring stuff i really got a problem with it it's a it's huh. a, not an issue for me with marvel it's an issue for me with modern superhero comics like it happens a lot and i got i got i got beef with it i don't like it <laughs> i think that's stuff we've tackled on the show before <laughs> definitely have and it sounds kelly like you need your column back because <laughs> you might have some thoughts that need to be shared i feel like <laughs> if they gave me that column back i'd be in big trouble these days there are a lot of things to say now that i've seen behind the curtain <laughs> well now, listen we've got a website yeah right? nobody's is, looking at it hey, we do you know this is the perfect platform <laughs> Uh, you have to be you on get time me with run us. out of comics immediately. <laughs> <laughs> now you're too good for that. Uh, just just a couple more uh, listener questions. Atomic Hound said, "Not limited to just comics. What current writers and artists inspire you?" Ooh. Um. So Roxanne Gay is someone I read as much of as I can. Um. She also is really great because. If anyone is on Substack or likes Substack, she's got a Substack. It's very good. She does like a roundup, like a weekly roundup. That's I'm always happy when we're pulling the same links. Like I'm like, oh, I've seen that. I've seen that. Cause then I feel cool like Roxane Gay. And um, 
the, but she also really does a great job of highlighting other writers. Um, so this is mostly short fiction, not comics, although she has featured comics a few times. But she'll have really incredibly powerful writers come on. And they're almost all sort of undiscovered voices. Like I looked at the requirements recently for what she publishes. And like you can't have a lot of credits. So she's really out there nurturing a lot of talent, which I really appreciate. Um, I have recently been reading and maybe it sucks to say this cause she's dead, but I recently started reading, um, Octavia Butler for the first time. Oh, and yeah. this, so that's been blowing my mind. Um, um, let's see comic. Let's go back to comics though. Um, I continue to be amazed by Tom King and Smallwood on Human target. Oh, love it. Oh, good. It's so good. It's sort of my dream book because I'm like a big. So if I hadn't gotten into comics, maybe one of a thing I would have gotten into because it's a hobby is real estate, not like being a realtor, but like I love looking at houses ever since I was a little kid. And my parents used to do this. We would like go on the weekends sometimes and look at open houses. And I just thought that was like a normal thing <laughs> people did. But apparently it's just an interest that my parents had that then transferred to me without me realizing it was weird. And so, you know, I'm on like Redfin every day, like looking at houses, like I'm fanatical about it. And it took me many years to realize that my perfect house will be a mid-century modern house. And so the mid-century modern vibes of our, uh, Human Target, I, it's literally everything I want in a book. Like, I just love it. I think it's um, it's exactly the kind of comics I want to read. Human um, Target was our book of the year. Yeah, as it should be. As it should be. It's I very almost good. hate how good it is. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I mean, I do because fuck those guys for being that good, man. Like when people a lot plus when people align as well as Tom and Mark have, I'm never gonna get it. Mark now, I'm never gonna be able to get in there. Like that's what ha- That's that's the only downside for me of that incredible synergy that you see between artists and writers is when you want to synergize <laughs> with one of those artists and you're like, I'm never gonna be able to get close to that guy now. Why would you talk to me when you got Tom King as your BFF? Like, I just don't even know. Um, Pepe Larraz, obviously. I mean, so good. But I can't wait. I'm going to do a self-plug here for a minute because Matty Adulius, which you guys may know from, he's done a bunch of stuff, but the thing he did with me before was Jessica Jones at Marvel, which he's beautiful on. Um, So, you know, he's been for the last year working on this, The Cull. Um, we're just finishing up issue three of five now and honestly guys it's so beautiful and weird and cool i can't wait for you guys to see it yeah i i'm i'm really excited for that now that i'm initiated Um, (laughs) i think it'll be this summer i haven't worked out the it'll be from image um Mm. but uh we haven't put ourselves on the schedule yet i was just waiting for us to lock down issue three before we did that because i don't want to have any delays um and the that incredible digital painting stuff that maddie is doing is very time consuming so i want to make sure we got it all locked down before we got on the schedule but uh yeah it's coming up i'm very excited for people to see it and uh I really hope they love it too, because, you know, it's hard for an artist. I know Mattia is enjoying the work very much. We talk about it a lot, like that he's having a good time and everything, because that's important to me, but it's hard to work for a year on a secret project Mm. that doesn't have stuff. Like it's very debilitating, I think, to like keep your energy up when you're not, whereas comics, one of the great things is you're like, you do a Captain America cover and then like, you can share it and talk about yeah. it and everyone's talking about it and it gets you back in people's minds again. And so, but the good news is that now that we're getting further along, I feel like I can start sharing a little more stuff on the sub stack. So hopefully this year we'll be seeing more teases and that'll be more fun for Mattia, but I hope everyone comes out big for this. Cause he's really, he's really going, going deep on this book. It looks amazing. If, if memory serves me correct, Jessica Jones was one of those digital first books. Uh, it was correct. So like, was, even then yeah. it was almost like a, stealth release if i remember it was yeah they basically yeah well, like a beyonce yeah. before beyonce was it was it. i think it was yeah it was yeah. like right after comic-con or during comic-con that they dropped the first issue which was really like two issues because they were yeah. yeah they didn't know what to do i mean listen the digital first thing 
you know, first guy through the wall gets bloody, right? Like yeah, we, yeah. you know, I think it really hurt us. Like I want to believe if we'd been a regular print issue, maybe we would have gone longer, but I'm just very grateful. We got the 12 we did because I really love them. And, you know, telling that purple daughter story. I mean, I'm not yeah. even sure I can like do better than that for Jessica. Like I would, if someone wanted me to write Jessica again, I would say yes, but I would really have to dig deep to be like, well, what do you do after that? Because like, I feel like I knew that that was our last shot and I just wanted to tell like the most important emotional intense story I could. And so we sort of swung for the fences there. Um, that does have one of my favorite examples of mixing artists though, because in issue five of the second run, second volume, um, Jessica is sort of trapped in a sort of mind prison kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And she, um, so we have Philippe and, uh, and drawn at, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Adra 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 Andrade. Andrade. I don't know if there's another E and N in there. Anyway, he's got a completely different, like highly stylized comic style, whereas Maddie's is so realistic. And so we brought him in for when she's trapped in this illusion. But then I told Alana, I was like, okay, but I I know it sucks for him, but I only want him to do 18 pages, and then I want Maddie because when the illusion breaks it's going to happen before the end of the book. But I want, when the illusion breaks, we need to go back to Madia. And she's like, I don't know. She's like, it's going to be really hard to talk them into that. I mean, I think it even happens mid page. So it's like they drew 18 and a half pages or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then it changes like with a punch, it changes back in to Madia's art when the illusion breaks. And honestly, it worked so well yeah. when it, when it all came, when it all started coming together, I said to Alana, I was like, did you see how good it was? And she's like, you were right. It worked. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, right. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's really hard to um, do this digital stuff and like figure out like, how do you market it? What's, what's too much. You know, our first issue of the coal is oversized, but you know, it's the first issue. It's not oversized like Black Cloak. It's only like 25 pages. And so it's like, how much of that can you really afford to give away in teasers and everything yeah. and like still have people feel like they really had something to read? And the call number one is very quiet. The whole first 10 pages, there's very little dialogue. Um, and then it's heavier on the back half. But um, so, yeah, sometimes I don't ever want people to feel ripped off. I feel like please slow down that would be my recommendation to anyone when reading the call number one a lot of the clues and details are in that incredibly detailed madia art and because his in detailed incredible very clear art is there you know i don't highlight it with a caption or a dialogue or whatever so like look make sure you're really absorbing what he's putting down. Like don't rush through those pages because they have one caption on, you know, like one locator caption on it. Um, but again, this is that engagement we were talking about at the beginning, the, engage the, the relationship with the reader and it's a risk doing it that way. But I do think it makes for a better comic. Um, maybe I lose some people, but I feel like the people I get really get it. You know, I mean, Maddie on art. I mean, you only really need to, show one page, right? right it's so. just sells itself <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> i will say that someone who was trying to approve it for something um i sent them the issue and uh they responded to me so quickly via email <laughs> they couldn't have possibly read it so i don't want to be pleased that they think it's so good i think they just know how good it looks and they're Weird. like this can't possibly go wrong and i'm like all right I agree. <laughs> <laughs> You'll take it, right? Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, one last listener question. This one's from Marking96. They say, I love Kelly's work. In X-Men Disassembled, she was working with Ed Brisson and Matthew Rosenberg. Which parts of the story did she work on? So Matt, Ed, and I did that in a way that I think very few people co-write where we wrote every issue together. Mm -hmm. Usually you would hand off like, oh, hey, you're taking this, you know, issues one through three and I'm doing four through six or whatever. But that said, every every relation, every co-write is different and every event is different. But we were in the room together from the jump and we thought our styles were close enough slash we were aware of each other's styles enough that we thought we could 
you know shape rub off the edges to make it pretty seamless and so how we ended up structuring it was you know we did the overall outline together and breaking all the story and all of that stuff but then when it came time to break down the issues um the first issue was supposed to be 30 pages so that's an easy 10 10 10 um and then they ended up making it 60 but that's another thing we won't get into um (laughs) but Uh, you know for the rest of the issues what we would do is whoever did the outline for that issue for that specific issue they would take the six section a six section and then the other two people would take seven so you'd have seven seven and six pages per issue um that sounded like very complex math but like it's literally (laughs) addition and subtraction um anyway uh so yeah it's pretty hard to tell who wrote what um we i will say that i i've never looked at comics this way before but they broke pretty naturally that way like you almost never had to interrupt a scene for someone to take over like it was pretty 776 was tended to be three scenes that work pretty well that way so it was interesting for me in that in that regard it's been fun to see people trying to pick out who wrote what but the funnest thing about it has been we usually can't remember or tell either um (laughs) like we were on a pot we did a thing together and someone was like i think so and so wrote that and I was like, mm, I don't know. And then it was a different one of us. Like, you know, so I think we did pretty well in that respect. That's cool. Yeah, I've always been curious about that aspect of like co-writing. And anytime we've interviewed someone who has done that, they mm-hmm. always give a similar answer of like, yeah, it's different. It's different depending on like who yeah. it is. Like when we interviewed Al Ewing, his process with Rom V was, you know, very different than that. Well, um, what can I? You don't have to get into detail, but I'm curious what it was because I I've wondered that myself. So, uh, Rom is tackling some of the 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 stuff with Dylan Brock, uh, Eddie's mm-hmm. child, and then uh, Al is do- dealing with Eddie and hmm. the the space stuff. So it kind of so a character makes, break. That's yeah. yeah, yeah, but that's interesting. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, when I did, you know, G Willow Wilson was technically a co write on um a force when i came on to it but that was more one of those technicality things where she did the plot and then she had to leave the book for family emergencies and so i inherited her plot but like she never weighed in again she wrote issue one and then she like never weighed in again that was it Mm -hmm. but she was a co-write through issue four because it was her plot so like that's a way it can happen with the plotting and writing separate when i the first time i did it for captain marvel that was with kelly pseudoconic um that was we all broke the story together like what it was going to be like the broad strokes and then kelly sue and sauna sent me off to do the beat sheet to like basically break down the arc into beats and then separate into separate into issue to issues and then after they approved that or we revised it together i would write the first draft and then kelly sue deconic would come in and like sprinkle her kelly sue magic on it and like really make it sing especially because that was my first thing for marvel so but i mean i learned so much like that was a great working experience in the sense that i learned so much like i would be hesitant to do anything that involved now with a co-writer like i wouldn't need it but for my first experience i just i think they should do that more for more new comics people coming in i mean i probably needed that less than a lot of people because i'd already been writing comics and i didn't come from tv or novels or something i'd been writing comics i went to scad you know i graduated from scad like i knew how to do that but it was still a super invaluable way to come into the industry. I feel like I learned so much more just from watching, just even from being copied on emails between Sana and Kelly. You know what I mean? Like you just get to watch the process in a different way than if a editor is like, okay, so here's what I need you to do. And then they'll want a script. And instead I got to, it was like a more organic way to be thrown into the mix. I thought, and I think a lot of writers, especially a lot of writers who don't come organically from comics, would benefit from what I got. Whereas I feel like a lot of them just get sort of thrown into the deep end of the pool and it can be really be a struggle and it doesn't always pay off. Is this, do you feel like this is uh, appropriate that it's almost like a, almost like an apprenticeship in a weird way? Like- yes. I, I mean, I, 
you know, I was paid. So right. I, you know, I don't want to suggest any of that. But yes, that first thing that I did with Kelly Sudaconic and Sana on Captain Marvel and the Carol Corps, it totally felt like an apprenticeship. Like I was being trained mm. to come in and do this. And that's what it should be. Because if you don't come from this or don't already have experience with this, it is a different art form. You have to be very careful about how much text you put on a page, how much text you put in a panel, how much text you put in a balloon. And these are things you get better at as you go along, but it's not intuitive. Like you just don't, you just don't know oh like 25 words in a balloon makes it feel too crowded like you know like these are just things you learn as you do it and seeing someone else be very good at it is a great example right to 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 give you good practices to move from and that was kind of like a flashpoint moment too kelly sue's captain marvel and and that was secret wars too yeah Yeah, that was was a lot going on that was the other joke that was it was such a weird deep end to be jumped into i remember kelly sue saying something like she's like the good news is if you can handle this secret wars (laughs) shit you can handle anything i was like okay (laughs) that's good and she's right because you know it was very complicated stuff all that battle world stuff and everything like you know there were a lot of hoops you had to jump through even just from the beat sheet like to make it yeah. fit within you know the stuff they were doing well look honestly uh i feel like we could do this all day <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like i've kept you up way too long i'm sorry <laughs> no, no, no. um well i'm tremendously grateful that Same. you've been so gracious with your time and and honestly extremely candid uh, it's it's sort of rare, I feel like, for creators to be this candid. So, um, oh, <laughs> wonder if I'll be getting some emails. <laughs> no, no one listens to this show. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Kelly. Like, huge, huge thank you. What do you want to leave the listeners with? And you know, any plugs you want to you know hit sure, us with? Sure, sure. Um, the best way to keep in touch with me. I mean, I am still on Twitter. I'm also on Hive at Kelly Thompson. If you're trying that out, probably I'll be on Spoutable. I'm going to try all of these things since the thing we all tried doesn't work anymore. Yeah. Uh, but I am still over there. But Substack is really the best way if you want to make sure not to lose track of me and to see what I'm up to. Um, that's 1979semifinalists.substack.com and um i don't do enough newsletters so if you're worried about getting too many don't worry about that you'll probably be fine i should <laughs> hey, be doing I think... it i should be doing it more not less so you may have just gotten a subscriber out of me then <laughs> watch me do like five posts next week and it's <laughs> right. like this is not what i signed up for <laughs> um but yeah uh that's the best way to keep track of me um black cloak second printing for issue one which has an incredible cover um that and black cloak two are in shops this month keep an eye out tell your shops you want them uh captain marvel 46 comes out next week it's one of my favorite issues from this brood story it's got gorgeous art by javier pina and really great coloring by um yen nitro i hope i'm saying that right what a cool name if i am saying it right right (laughs) that's amazing if i didn't butcher that it's like the greatest name i want that to be my name (laughs) i know right um and uh and clayton cowles as ever so (laughs) <laughs> Can I ask you a question about Clayton Cowles? And, and this is just a theory I have, so just please confirm or deny. <laughs> is is Clayton Cowles um, in a basement tied to a chair, <laughs> all, not allowed to do anything else? Like, Because he's on everything. I don't understand. He's, he's very good, and he is on everything. You know, the funny thing is, um, in – in my experience, I guess I can't speak for all writers, but in my experience, the big two, or at least Marvel, keeps you very separate from the letterer. And I don't mm. know what that huh. is. I, maybe it's just to keep control of the schedule. But I almost never really get to talk to my letterers. So, like, my interactions with Clayton are mostly through social media where I'd be like, Clayton is the best. Like, I mean, let's, you know, <laughs> occasionally I'll see him on an email thread and I'll be like, oh, my God, Clayton, hi. Like, whatever. <laughs> so, but, yeah, I mean, they're just workhorses, I think. They just, like, you know, they th- that's not a high page rate cost. Mm, yeah. So you got to do a lot of books. And as someone who really struggled the last year managing that – I can only imagine what that workload looks like when you're a letterer doing that many books. Like, God, just keeping track of it must be insane. Man, I uh, I do some lettering for a, a big company, and I have one book a month, and it's 
a lot for me. Yeah. Can so you I imagine? Know, yeah. Juggling like wild. Yeah. Absolutely wild. Unsung well, like, hero. But also the letterers are always the person we all know. They're always the person who's getting screwed because they're the last yep. person <laughs> in the production cycle. Mm hmm. They are, they're frequently almost always having to letter over black and white instead of color, which shouldn't matter. But come on, it does. It does. If I'm a letterer, I'd be like, I wish I knew what these colors were. I mm. totally would feel that way. So, and then you're also, and this is because this is my first image book. This is my first time. This is my first time dealing with the printing process when I haven't been protected from the printing process mm. by my editor. And let me tell you what. Editors are doing a lot of protecting because whew, that is, I, I think I particularly find it stressful because it's just a thing that I'm not particularly suited to. Like I'm a very cautious person and sort of a careful person. And like the idea that you're the last bastion of the printing proofs and like all these things. And that like, Oh, Hey, if you don't make this deadline, it doesn't go to print and you miss your win. Like all of that stuff I find very stressful and like high stakes. Yeah. And the letter is dealing with that all the time because they're the last guy that the editor is going, what the fuck, man, I got to get this <laughs> to print, you know, yeah. whatever. So I just can't even, I can't even fathom doing that for many books in a month and having to deal with that. I mean, they just must be very good at that. And they also must have a, just a, a slightly different disposition as to like how tense they are about it. Like, I think I am not suited to it. Like, you know, leave me in a room alone with no food and a laptop. I'll probably put out a script, but tell me that I have to do all this printing stuff and these specs and like, is the art right? Oh my God. Nightmare. It doesn't help that one of the weeks that I was doing this stuff for image, I watched an episode of Chippendales where he basically doesn't check the proofs and they end up with 500,000 calendars that all have the wrong like they all have January on every month or something oh like that. God. Cause he didn't look at the Tremendous. proofs. And I was just like, Oh my, I got to check my image files again, man. I got to <laughs> It's not good for me. <laughs> well, I want to reiterate to everyone. Black cloak is phenomenal. Uh, you need to go buy this. We didn't, I didn't do enough to say how amazing Meredith McLaren is in this book. Uh, it's phenomenal. I think, the script is great. Obviously, Kelly's great, but this art is incredible. incredible. If I, if you don't mind, I'd love to just flip no, through this yeah. real quick. Yeah. Although like, I think one of the great things about it is that it doesn't really look like anything else. Yeah. Out and that, there. yeah, yeah. That and like that it, was yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, it feels like something. It feels familiar and comforting to me, but it just looks different. It looks really modern and unlike everything else I see, which excites me. So, yeah, yeah, I I completely agree. I think this that that really set it apart. And then you know, it's almost like you're you're wooed in by this amazing art, and then it's like, but there's also a tremendous story here. It is oversized, so you feel like you're getting more bang for your buck. At least that's how I felt. We well, definitely I'm... are getting it. Literally, <laughs> more bang for your buck. Like almost three times the bang. <laughs> right, exactly. And who doesn't want more bang? So go buy Black Cloak. It's fantastic. You're going to love it. Kelly, thank you so much. I would love to do this again. We really appreciate it. And uh, a live stream, we will be right back in a moment.
oh, uh, uh. I gotta fix. I didn't realize my three man was all messed, messed up. All right, hold on. You, uh, you but we're live. I'll, right? I'll fix it. Yeah. You could just go. cool. Yeah. Hey, so that was fantastic. Uh, I feel like we all had such a good time. I know I did. What a blast. Um, yeah, Kelly Thompson is awesome. Like, I didn't know necessarily like what to expect because you, you just never know. Yeah. Um, but like that was that was exciting. Uh, yeah, I've been a fan for a while, so like it's cool seeing like mm. like when you're a fan of someone and like oh wait they're actually cool as shit too like right. My favorite part is that I don't know what she looks like, and so I always imagine her as her Twitter icon. And what Tyler had on the on the on the uh, uh, on the YouTube screen was her uh, Kate Bishop Leo, uh, yeah. yeah, the Kate Bishop icon. So to me, it's just Kate Bishop talking to us. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, you know, that's not bad. Um, yeah, no, Kelly's great. And I think um, I think we definitely will have her back on at some point. Um, go buy Black Cloak if you have. And I did see we couldn't get to it. And I'm sorry, like live chat. It's, it's tough to get to some of the stuff that you guys say during the interview. That's why it really is best if you right in ahead of time like if you're on the discord we answered every single discord question um so if you're on the discord that's the best way to do it live chat is is a little tougher um just because we're in our own rhythm and like you know there's a lot of stuff going on um but yeah go buy black cloak i saw some of you say that you were going to go ahead and get that so uh i would definitely encourage it um we're not going to do news that was enough. We feel like that interview stands alone. Uh, um, guys, John Ken's going to injustice. Uh, we're gone. We're, that's it. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Maybe next week I'll get on my soapbox about what Ho Che Anderson said about uh, Luke Cage City on Fire. Oh boy. Um, yeah. We'll talk about that someday. Exactly. The show. The yeah. show's going to be on fire. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, uh, doing interviews is probably. It, my favorite part of the show is is us, but like second to that is getting to speak to these to these creators and like pick their brain. And I feel like Kelly said things. Um, I feel like Kelly said things that other people just won't say, and that and that was something that I really appreciated too. I, I like the fact that like I didn't know she had done podcasting and comics. Like, uh, yeah. like I remember the she has no head thing, but like I didn't really put the pieces together. Like, oh, she used to review comics. You know what I mean? Like, it just didn't compute yeah. to me until then. Um, so it was like, oh, she speaks our language a bit, right? Um, mm. Which was which is really fun. Yeah, when I when I like read that in the research, I was like, oh shit, yeah, I cannot <laughs> wait to get to this part because that's gonna be so fun. Um, and I wish we had more time because I had more more things to say about that. But um, hopefully soon enough. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, we're gonna leave it there. Um, do join us next week. We may or may not have a major announcement. Maybe. We should find but, out tomorrow. Yeah, we can't we can't talk about it right now, but you will know soon if that is the case. Either way, Ant Man is next week, so you will be getting Quantum Mania the week after. So yeah, you, know, you got exactly. something to look forward to. That's geez, when's the last time we did a movie review? Wakanda Forever. Yeah, yeah. shit. Yeah, so November. Man, it's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's been our our Ant Man and Wasp review will be out uh, next week Monday. So uh, tune in for that. Um, maybe a special announcement. Look at Twitter, look at Instagram, look at TikTok. Join the Discord, honestly, because like almost the moment we find out whether we're gonna have this thing, Discord's gonna know everything right else. Discord. You know, we have to like prepare. Tyler has to put together, you know, a, maybe a video, an image, whatever. Yeah. Discord will know. Well, so, and we and the patrons know even more because yes. there's something else we've been working on that the patrons have some. Uh, mm some hidden knowledge of and thank Absolutely. you patrons for like not leaking that i appreciate that and hey hey y'all hey y'all patrons i just got the first seat of the new thing y'all gonna be eating good y'all eating <laughs> good on patreon let me tell you <laughs> absolutely so that's patreon.com slash the comics pals if you you know if you enjoyed the interview if you had a good time uh at least check it out just check it out if you can't do that if 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 uh you know the money's not right, you can always just hit that follow button, hit that subscribe button, 
on YouTube or Twitch. On Twitch, you can actually give us an Amazon Prime sub, a Twitch Prime sub. So that's free for you. Um, and we do appreciate that. Even a retweet, literally anything, an Apple podcast review, all that stuff helps. We enjoy doing this and uh, we appreciate that you guys support and uh, show that you enjoy what we do. So thank you. And guys even for that. if you print out a uh, like a, a whole bunch of one page uh, uh, pictures of our podcast with a, with our link written down, and you just plaster them around street poles across your neighborhood, like green <laughs> green uh, grassroots. Let's do it, guys. Let's do that. Unreal. I saw a skywriter one time do that for it. Must have been Joe Rogan. But if we could get one of those, you know, that would help a lot. I think honestly. I thought like I thought like billboards and stuff like well yeah patrons <laughs> let's get some do, more patrons you... <laughs> <laughs> get one over Jones Beach you know yeah Kefis will do it I feel like Kefis is the one Kefis, Kefis, I mean, that, that should have been the bet you know like Kefis yeah. is the one to get us a billboard or yeah. or you get... like you guys were saying like a plane with a, with with our logo I mean, you just got something like you got to bait him into a, a bet that's all listen I might not be out the woods in, in our bet. It's true. I, it's true. There's yeah. been some some traction. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Four is, is uh, going to be shooting soon. So, um, yeah, that's it for the show today. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, we do have to do plugs, of course. Kale, you're up. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Comics Pals. You can find me and my work at kaleward.com. That's C-A-L-E-W-A-R-D.com. You're good, Kale? Y- you can. <laughs> <laughs> You ever you ever become conscious of your own name as you're spelling it? Did you just hit the singularity or something? Like yeah. you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Toto in Toe. That's T O T O I N T O W. Um, my Patreon newsletter was this month, this week, and uh, I did uh, my story, my storylining process for uh, Hollyoaks, which is a, a, a soap opera here in the UK that I'm gonna get to pitch to. Oh. Um, Oh. This uh, this semester, so I'm uh, I'm really excited about getting to do that. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but in this newsletter, I uh, I broke down uh, what would have been uh, two Wednesday's episode, and I gotta say, I hadn't seen it when I wrote it. I wasn't terribly far off. Interesting. Okay. Um. Tyler, uh, you could follow me at the Tyler Olson Instagram and Twitter. Um, you can see us on a billboard that Kevis apparently put up. <laughs> uh, Kevis, can you just uh, specifically get the billboard that uh, Tommy Wiseau had the room on? Mm-hmm. That's a big mm-hmm. one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Although I think I think an OnlyFans model might currently be using that billboard. So I, we don't have OnlyFans money um, yet. Kevis might. You don't know. That's true. That's true. He's the one paying. <laughs> F is on wiki feet. <laughs> you said it, not me. And I, you're listen, the one that I, reacted. I never uh, denied. It's a podcast show. I had that's that's half the job. Nope. You could have went on with your plug, and then I could have done my plug, and show be over. All right. Well, plugs, only fans. What are we talking about anymore? Like mm-hmm. exactly. <laughs> uh, as for me, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Sean Soapbox. I got to watch The Last of Us before one of you jokers spoils it for me. So, Bro, uh, can I just don't... tell you something? No. No, no, no not, it's not... not about plot or anything. Um, okay. It is just a wild thing that happened to me, and, like, it felt weird. Um, I watched it last night, and I cried. And, like, I don't do that. Tyler cried? Let me tell you something. Tyler, Tyler doesn't have emotions. Oh, okay? I have a hard outer shell. So the fact that Tyler cried to The Last of Us, well, that's it, remarkable. It also maybe just means that I just got that the shell just slowly got broken down by life. And that was just the, the straw that broke the camel's back, you know, because I texted a friend of the show, Matt, um, who cries about everything media related. Um, and he was like, no, I didn't do that for me. And I'm like, well, OK, so I might have just had a day, guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, thank you for sharing that. And yeah. Murphy has some shit going on. So. <laughs> Well, uh, I'm going to watch The Last of Us, then uh, then uh, Super Bowl time tomorrow. So that should be fun. I got to enjoy watch that. Drag Race. Huh? I got to watch Drag Race. I didn't watch it last night because of The Last of Us. Oh, all right. Well, so the Super Bowl's getting bumped? Wait, it's the- 24 hours in a day. 
I'm not a Super Bowl guy. I'm going to a friend's house for the Super Bowl, but like I'm going to be the guy there who's like, ooh, commercials, you know? Yeah, yeah, please. I'm going to watch commercials, drink beer, and eat wings, I guess. like that's I, pl- the- I plan on making a nice um, lime cordial to make some fresh gimlets for this Super Bowl party, which uh, is way too high class for a Super Bowl party. But, you know, mm. a guy like me. I'm going to make a mess in my kitchen tonight, that's for sure. Yes, there is a Flash trailer being dropped during the Super Bowl, so that's definitely something I'm looking forward to. I still to. don't think it's a real movie. You know what I mean? Like, I got to see that trailer to be convinced. Oh, but, yeah, we didn't talk. We didn't have room to talk about it. That poster looks like shit. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what I don't know what that was about. Um, it's it's just a dumpster fire, honestly, <laughs> like the whole the whole fl- I don't understand anyone at DC being excited about this movie like I, I, don't, I don't know contractual it's obligations. Movie. It's in everyone. Maybe closet. it's good. Yeah. What if it's what if it really is, according to James Gunn, one of the best superhero movies of all time? Great birthday gift a- for us, Sean. It's still got a super criminal in it, like, <laughs> <laughs> and it and it's not it's that's not the antagonist of the film, so that's a major problem. But uh, t- look, clearly, clearly, like we could just do an hour talking shit, but we're not gonna do that. So we will see you guys next week. Thank you for listening. Until then, we're the Comics Pal signing off. Take care, guys.